Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kim Williams and Chair of Medicine. And uh, as we're very pleased this morning to have infectious disease, working on one of the biggest problems that we have in the United States, growing problems as our population gets bigger. I don't mean numerically. Uh, and that is diabetes and, and its risk of infection. And it's going to be given by Dr. Ryan Doster, but for the proper introduction, we're gonna turn it over to our Infectious Disease Division Chief, Dr. Forrest Arnold. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Doster comes to us from Indiana where he went to IU Medical School. And then he did MedPeds down at Vanderbilt where he stayed for an Infectious Diseases Fellowship and during his fellowship, he started a PhD program under the direction of Dr. Dr. David Aronoff, studying Streptococcus agalacti, uh, which he finished and then transferred or you know, graduated and came here to U of L in 2022 and still studies uh, his strep with a KOA award. He has uh, nearly 30 publications, and you may recognize him from his service because he does awards up on the floor. He uh, has done teaching to the residents and the fellows, so you may recognize him there, and of course he continues his research. He's one of the stars of our division, and I'm very happy to turn the podium over to Dr. Doster. All right, thank you everyone for being here. So I'm gonna dedicate this presentation to our fellows because this is a topic that's already come up at least three times this week while I've been on surface. And we're gonna be talking about how diabetes is a risk of infection. We've had a theme in grand rounds since uh, Dr. Williams has come. And part of that theme is kind of the mixing of nutrition, comorbidities. And we're gonna look at it today through the uh, lens of infections, but not just from the host perspective, but also from the pathogen. Let's see if we can get, I have no financial disclosures. And so we're going to break this talk today into three different parts. We're going to talk about a case presentation and some clinical data. We're going to get into some basic pathophysiology. And then we're going to do some primary uh, data coming out of my lab as we look at vaginal colonization. So I want to start with a case. And this is actually a case that I encountered as a fourth year medical student. And I didn't realize at the time that this would become a theme in my research much later. So this starts with a 74-year-old woman presenting with fevers and altered mental status. Her husband notes that she was complaining of a little bit of headache yesterday, but was otherwise fine. And then last night, she became acutely altered with acute onset of fevers. And to the point, she was no longer communicating with him. She's got a past medical history of type 2 diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C of 11.4%, hypertension, and coronary artery disease. On exam, she's febrile and tachycardic, blood pressure slightly low. She's sat in 92% uh, on room air and she's got a BMI of 34. She's toxic appearing. She basically just lays in bed and moans. She doesn't follow commands or answer any questions. You notice that when you flex her neck passively that she's got a pass, uh, hip flexion. So Brzezinski sign, we're concerned about meningitis potentially in this patient with fever and altered mental status. She's tachycardic. Uh, abdomen is soft and there's no uh, wounds that you see on her skin. You get your initial data back and she's got a leukocytosis and elevated creatinine. And because you're concerned about meningitis, the team performs a lumbar puncture that shows 720 white cells. 98% uh, of those are polys. Glucose is low at 25 and proteins elevated at 70. So as part of your workup, you get a meningitis PCR and blood and CSF cultures. Wrong way here, there we go. And when those come back, they grow initially on the PCR, identify Streptococcus agalactiae, but then blood and urine culture, or CSF cultures also grow Streptococcus agalactiae. And so when we encounter these patients on rounds, the first thing the family and the patient wants to know is why did this happen and how can I prevent it from happening again? Because unlike some of these other uh, medical conditions, infections tend to be sudden and they tend to be a little bit nebulous to the families. So we'll answer those questions, but then my questions to my trainees are, is this a typical presentation? Does this make sense from what you understand about infection pathophysiology? Is this a typical pathogen for this presentation? And if so, where does it normally live and how did the patient get it? Is this a typical patient 
Is there any specific patient factors that increase the risk for this condition? And is there something that we can do to prevent this from happening again? So if we look back at this case and we look at from the lens of the patient, what are the particular risk factors that I could identify? One would be her age, her diabetes, and particularly her relatively poorly controlled diabetes and her BMI. What about the pathogen? Is this a normal pathogen in this case? And the answer is no. If you would have told me this patient was 74 hours old or maybe 74 days old, I'd say this makes perfect sense. But the fact that this patient is elderly, this is not a usual presentation. We'd think of things like strep pneumo, maybe listeria, something else. And so what do we know about Streptococcus agalactiae? So this is also called group B Streptococcus. It's a gram positive non-modal bacteria that if we screen everyone in the room, it's present in probably about 25% of adults in the GI tract. There it causes no problems. We've known again about GBS since the 70s, primarily as a cause of neonatal infections, neonatal sepsis, preterm birth, meningitis, and neonates. But I'm gonna show you a lot of data today suggesting that we're gonna use this as a kind of model organism when we talk about diabetes, because we're seeing this more and more commonly in our elderly adults or immunosuppressed adults and our adults with diabetes. So I think, again, I've had about three conversations with people in the ID service today about just the same thing. And so these are different scanning electromicrographs from my lab looking at different strains of group B strep. So how can we understand what's going on in the country regarding these GBS infections? So the CDC actually has what's called the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance Network. So these are 10 sites throughout the country that basically collect data on different pathogens that are isolated from non-sterile sites and give that information to the CDC so that they can monitor it. Okay, and so this is actually a freely available dashboard. You can go in there and look at data for group A strep, group B strep, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis, and strep pneumo. And what I want you to appreciate is since 1997, we've almost had a doubling of these infections over the last 30 years. Now, some of these are neonatal infections, but our neonatal infections are actually going down. So these adult infections make up the majority of this increase. So if we look at individual data by age, what you can see is when you're very young, you have both a very high case rate and a very high death rate. Again, that's been known since the 70s. That's where we normally think of these infections occurring. But when we see during adulthood and early, uh, kind of early to late childhood, there's very few of these infections. It just doesn't happen. But as we get over 65, over 50, we see the, both the case rate and the incident rate of GBS going up. And so using this data from the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance Network, these authors went by and over a couple of years, they looked at 4,000 cases and tried to understand what the risk factors were for this increase. And this is a busy table, but I'm going to walk you through it. So this looks at the incidence per 100,000 population, and they're going to look at it by age, BMI category, or whether or not you had diabetes. Okay. So let's start by age. So if we look in the same BMI category, moving down from 18 to 44, 45 to 64, 65 and older, you can see the incidence in the population going from very low, getting higher and getting higher as we get older. That's probably not surprising. We see that with a lot of different infections. What about by BMI? So even at the younger age population, you can see that there's about a six fold increase in incidence in these otherwise healthy adults that don't normally get GBS infections if you have class three obesity. And we see similar trends at the, at the older age groups. Now, what about if you add diabetes? So if you look across the rows, you can see, even if you have a normal BMI and uh, normal age, if you have diabetes, your incidence of GBS skyrockets, right? That's over a hundred fold increase. You can see across that younger age group, there's about a 20 fold adjusted rate ratio, about a 10 fold if you are 45 to 64, and if you're 65 and older, it's about five fold. So these increasing risks kind of stack upon each other. So we've talked about group B strep. Let's talk about diabetes and obesity. This probably comes to no surprise to anyone listening to this presentation. But if we look at the diabetes surveillance system, 
back in 20, uh, 2004. And you can basically stratify the data by the percent of the population with obesity and increasing blue color and the diagnosed diabetes and increasing red color. You can see there were some areas in the US Southeast that had relatively high marks. But over a five year period, you've seen this explosion starting in the US Southeast. And then in, by 2019, 10 years later, there's basically no part of the US that doesn't have high rates of obesity, high rates of diabetes. Okay, so if we look at the actual numbers, the CDC rec, uh, now estimates that about 12% of the US population has diabetes. A good proportion of this is undiagnosed. And if we look at those people with prediabetes, it's about 40% of our population. And if you're looking at the over uh, 65 age group, it's almost 50%, right? These numbers are exploding. And this is gonna have consequences. We've talked about cardiovascular disease in the past. We're gonna focus on infections today. If we wanna look a little bit closer to home using that same dashboard, we can look at the statistics from Kentucky. So I'm gonna highlight Jefferson County and I'm gonna highlight a county in the far east, Pike County. So again, we can graph this by diagnosis in diabetes here in blue, obesity and increasing red, purple, you have both. So 11% diabetes in Jefferson County, about 30% obesity. You can see in Pike County that is even higher, almost 40% obesity. Now, I recommend people go to this website because you can actually look at different things. You can actually hear we're graphed by food insecurity, right? If you don't have food, you're like, oh, could they actually have high rates of obesity? And they do. So Pike County, high rates of uh, diabetes, high rates of obesity, almost 20% food insecurity. So the next question that often comes up on rounds are, when I ask the fellows, why did this happen? And they say, well, the patient's immunocompromised, they have diabetes. And is that true? So historically, when we think about immunocompromised patients, we think of these kind of typical conditions. You have an active solid uh, tumor or a hematologic malignancy and you're on treatment. You've had a transplant or you're on CAR T therapy. You have maybe a primary immunodeficiency. Those present more often as kids, advanced HIV in, in my world, or you're getting treatment with some of these agents that we know dampen the immune system, right? And the one thing I want you to think about is when we have a primary immune deficiency or even some of the medicines we use for cancer, chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, most of the time there is a predictable risk for certain types of infections, right? So if you have a humoral disorder where you don't make antibodies, where we see those infections most commonly are in the mucosal surfaces, in the ears, in the sinus, in the lungs. If you have a complement deficiency, we know you don't combat encapsulated organisms as well. So you have higher risk for strep pneumo, H flu, and Neisseria. So as we talk about diabetes, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. So are patients with diabetes at risk of infection? And there's been a lot of studies over the last five years that look at great data at the population level that we can actually do this in different systems. And we're gonna talk about some of those. So this first study looks at that risk in a national cohort study. So this is a group from South Korea. They looked at 66,000 people with diabetes, 132,000 controls and followed them for eight years. And they found the incidence rate ratio if you had diabetes compared to your control was two. So you're at twice as likely to have an infection during that period. If we look at this, all these different types of infections and I'm gonna highlight pneumonia, cellulitis and urinary tract infections so you can more easily follow them from study to study. You can see the incidence rate of 1.57 for pneumonia, 1.52 for cellulitis, 1.8 for urinary tract infections. What about outpatients? So most of those infections were hospitalized infections. This study looks at a Danish uh, patient registry. So they're um, again, national health kind of network at type two diabetics. And their outcome here was community-based antibiotic prescriptions. So they're gonna use antibiotics prescriptions as that kind of marker of, does this person have an infection? And I'll show specific data on the next slide. But if you look at the adjusted rate ratio, about 25% increase if you have diabetes compared to their comparison cohort. So let's look at those specific infections again. So to have pneumonia, uh, a adjusted rate ratio of 1.31, urinary tract infections 1.41, and skin and soft tissues about 1.5. So somewhere in the range of 25 to 50% more likely to have these infections. 
the next question I think it often gets asked is, does glycemic control matter? Is having diabetes itself enough to increase your risk of infection? Or is it just those people that don't take care of their diabetes or maybe can't even get into care for their diabetes and they come in, they have an elevated hemoglobin A1C. And so this is a matched cohort from the UK uh, looking at type one diabetic patients and they've matched them uh, one to two based on age, sex, and ethnicity and did adjustments for socioeconomic status, BMI, smoking, and comorbidities. And what you can see is they broke it down both by primary care infections as well as hospitalizations. And even at baseline, these people that have a hemoglobin A1C around 7%, there was still an adjusted incident rate of 1.5 for primary care infections and two for hospitalizations. But probably not surprisingly to most people, as the hemoglobin A1C increases, suggesting poor glycemic control, especially for hospitalizations, that incident rate goes way up. And if we look at, again, those specific type of infections, are going to highlight bone and joint infections because we'll talk about diabetic foot infections. Again, poor hemoglobin A1C, your incidence rates are very high, but they're also high for your genitourinary infections, your respiratory infections, and your skin and soft tissue infections. So what about patients on glucose lowering drugs? So if we get these people on medications, can it help? And this uh, population study from Taiwan looked at those people who either got metformin for greater than 28 days, that kind of standard therapy for type two diabetes or those not receiving metformin. And they were gonna specifically look at hospitalization for pneumonia, mechanical ventilation and death. And when they looked at either again, type two diabetes without metformin or those with metformin for all cause pneumonia, they didn't see much of a difference. You can see the confidence interval crosses one. But when they look specifically at bacterial pneumonia invasive mechanical ventilation and respiratory cause of death, those patients that were on metformin actually had protection from that metformin. So is that specifically to metformin or something else? Well, they looked into this a little bit more. And for developing bacterial pneumonia, the longer that you were on metformin, your adjusted hazard ratios actually went down, right? Same thing for the mechanical ventilation and respiratory death. If you were on metformin for more than a year, you had more protection than if you were on it for half a year or half a year to a year. Not only that, but if you look at the cumulative dose, the higher dose people were on, the more protection they had. Now this could be because they were looped into care, they were doing the other things they need to do to try to control their diabetes. Um, but it is, I think, kind of interesting, does metformin have some other inherent bacterial, antibacterial property, immune boosting property or something else? Well, what about other glucose lowering drugs? Going back to the Danish National Patient Registry, this study is going to look at your first glucose lowering drug prescription, whether you were on metformin, which the majority of their patients in this population were. Uh, sulfonylureas were about 13%, insulin 6%. And again, they're going to look at community-based antibiotic use as a measure of outpatient infections or hospital-treated infections. So here, metformin is your comparator. And probably not surprising, if you were started on insulin, you have a slightly higher, it's pretty minimal, risk for community-based infections. Uh, but when they do their kind of model for kind of controlling other comorbidities, there's still a pretty good increase in the amount of hospital-associated infections. Now, we can probably uh, uh, infer that there's some degree of worse glucose control, maybe they're um, really a high hemoglobin A1C at initiation of therapy, and maybe that's where they were started on insulin. For sulfonylureas, there was a slight increase in hospital-treated um, infections, and most of the other uh, classes they looked at, they didn't have enough numbers to really probably power the study to look at those. So I wanna say a word about SGL2 inhibitors. So these are sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. And so basically what normally happens is when you have high um, glucose in the blood, it gets filtered out in the glomerulus, and it's these transporters job to reabsorb that glucose. So there's not a whole lot of glucose going into the urine. These medication class basically block this transporter. And as a result, you're gonna lose more of that glucose in your urine. 
This has shown moderate uh, benefits for hemoglobin A1C, but it's also shown a reduction in cardiovascular events. So atherosclerotic mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, disease progression for uh, diabetic kidney disease, as well as weight loss. But in uh, 2014, the FDA started putting out warnings that there may be an increased risk for urinary and genitourinary infections, right? And so this study, um, from Korea basically looks at cohorts that got metformin and plus one other medications, whether it's the SGL2 inhibitor or another class, sulfonylureas were their biggest comparison group. And their primary outcome here was UTIs or genital infections. And so when we compare the number of events for the SGL2 inhibitors versus their comparison group, looking at these different drug classes, for UTIs, there was a hazard ratio of about 1.57, 1.6, 1.9, so about a 50 to 70% increase in these UTIs in these groups, but a slightly even higher group of genital infections. So that may be vulvovaginal candidiasis, that may be more uh, invasive necrotizing infections in the groin. So to recap section one, Population rates of diabetes and obesity are quickly increasing. That's not a surprise. But with that increasing prevalence, we are seeing more infections and more infections that were previously relatively rare. Patients with diabetes are certainly at increased risk of infection. And this is really broadly defined because we've seen it both with outpatient infections and those that require hospitalization. It looks like if your hemoglobin A1C is higher, that carries an increased risk of infections. Some medications like the SGL2 inhibitor might predispose patients to certain infections, particularly genital urinary infections, whereas metformin seems to have a slight protective effect. So I wanna switch gears. We've talked a lot about clinical studies. Let's go to some basic pathophysiology. And so what's going on in these patients that put them at increased risk of infections? So if we think about what normally has to happen when you fight infections with your immune system, and I'm gonna focus on the innate immune system primarily. And so when bacteria encounter mucosal surfaces, get under those mucosal surfaces into the soft tissues or sometimes deeper like bacteremia, they're recognized by either damage or pathogen associated molecular patterns on receptors on our cells. And they start signaling out danger signals saying, hey, I need help here. Let's call in our neutrophils or macrophages or other immune cells to come fight. And so those are mediators like IL-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-6 or IL-8. And we know that in patients with diabetes, they don't, they're not able to amount that same response. So these initial cytokine signals are blunted. After the neutrophil gets those signals, it needs to traffic to the site of infection. They um, upregulate the expression of certain receptors to allow them to get out of the blood and get to the site where they need to. And once they're there, they have several different mechanisms to kill bacteria. They can use complement or antibodies to help phagocytose or eat bacteria. And so here's a picture of a macrophage grabbing a chain of group B strep, working on phagocytosing that chain of bacteria. They can degranulate, meaning that they release a lot of antimicrobial peptides that will kill the bacteria, or they can release what's called extracellular traps. So these are basically a mixture of chromatin within the cell, as well as antimicrobial peptides that they literally shoot out in this net-like structure. And depending on what you're watching this on, you can actually see a chain of group B strap here and here trapped in that chromatin. And so that gives a locally high concentration of these antimicrobial peptides that kill these bacteria. Now, during diabetes, none of this works quite right. There's a slightly uh, diminished phagocytic response. There's decreased reactive oxygen burst and bacterial killing. There's less net formation. There's less degranulation. Complement doesn't work quite as well. And there's changes in polarization in some of our cells, meaning that they shift from this anti as active uh, inflammatory cell that's there basically to kill bacteria to more of a tissue remodeling healing type cell. So you have dysfunction at multiple levels of this inflammation process. What about the acquired immune system? We see this probably most often in the terms of vaccines. Because you can't mount those initial cytokine changes, your B cells and your T cells don't work as well. 
And so you have moderately reduced vaccine responses. So here's uh, a study looking at response to the influenza vaccine for different antigens, whether you have diabetes here in the circles or non-diabetes group in the triangles. And you can see they're not dramatically decreased, but a little bit. And that's, I think, what we're going to kind of see throughout these recurring themes. All these slight defects add up to big events. So what about obesity? So obesity and type 2 diabetes run together really strongly, right? There's all of these kind of overlap in the patients that we see. And so the immune deficits here are slightly different. So there's certainly mechanical factors. So we think about, especially for pulmonary infections, there's pulmonary restriction if you have massive obesity, decreased pulmonary volumes, and ventilation perfusion mismatching. But if we look at the inflammation, the interaction between adipose tissue and macrophages actually leads to a higher background level of inflammation. So as opposed to diabetes where you can't mount that kind of initial immune response, here your threshold is already higher because of the background and level of inflammation because of the adipose tissue. So when it's time to get those signals, you still don't respond as well. And so when we look at diabetes and obesity, even though they get to a similar spot, they start from a different place. So those elevated glucose levels impair the cytokine secretion, whereas in obesity, you have that increased inflammatory tone. So with that high background, you have lower overall responses. They all lead to decreased pathogen sensing, decreased trafficking of immune cells to the site of infection and decreased microbial killing. So I've been looking for studies to try to put this in context, right? I've been telling you all this time that these people are at risk for infections, they have immune dysfunction, but how severe is that immune dysfunction? And there's not many studies that I could look at and say, oh, if I look at a primary immunodeficiency like a complement deficiency, here are rates of these infections and I can compare that directly to diabetes. This study um, was a meta-analysis basically looking at reactivation of TB. So TB is a common infection and in, not in this part of the world, but in other parts of the world. And we know that it can lay dormant. And if you have immunosuppression, your risk of that reactivation is higher, right? And so one of the areas in my world, we see this most often is in HIV AIDS, not as common anymore, but this used to be a big deal. Now we're seeing it more with people on biologics like tumor necrosis factor blocking agents where we have to screen these patients for latent TB before we start them because if you start them on therapy, their risk for reactivation goes up if they're not treated. So this study, you can see there's wide ranges based on the population they look at. I'd say look at the numbers on the right and use that as a guide to put diabetes in context with these other things, right? So while they are immunosuppressed, I don't know that I would call them truly immunocompromised. I'd say, especially in higher hemoglobin A1Cs, they may be approaching patients who are in some degree of moderate corticosteroid use. All right, well, let's look at a couple of specific types of infections that we see really commonly in the hospital. So let's start with diabetic foot infections. So why does this happen? So it's not just the impaired immunologic function. Diabetes actually has several different effects on the body that culminate in these infections. They cause a motor neuropathy that leads to foot deformities like a short short code deformity that changes the biomedical uh, biomechanical properties of the foot, leading to kind of specific changes in pressure. You have a sensory neuropathy where the patient can no longer feel and protect that area. And then you have an autonomic neuropathy where you have decreased sweating, dry skin, and all of that culminates that dry skin, that changing in the pressure points of the foot into a callus formation. When you add that to repetitive trauma and maybe peripheral arterial disease where you can't heal the tissue because you have poor blood flow, that can lead to these diabetic foot infections, right? So here's another way of showing it, those same uh, neuropathy changes, the pressure on the foot, plus your impaired delivery, your impaired immune function, maybe um, maladaptive behaviors leads to these diabetic foot infections. So if we look at the microbiology of the diabetic foot infections, this starts as a skin and soft tissue infection. So it's not surprisingly that we see skin bugs like Staph aureus uh, or Enterococcus as being kind of the initial bugs or the most common bugs that we see. Now you, again, you can see group B strep here representing a decent portion of these infections where we would not normally see group B strep as a skin and soft tissue infection in anybody. 
We do have some gram negative infections. We worry about pseudomonas, even though we probably worry about it more than it's actually there. It's probably only about 10 to 15% of most cases. What I wanna show you on this other side is that as we do more 16S or next gen sequencing, we're gonna learn more about what's actually in here. So this study basically looks at about eight patients with diabetic foot infections that either had routine culture studies or 16S sequencing. And what I want you to take away is that 16S sequencing uh, identified about 50% more bacteria than we were getting on traditional culture. And a lot of these are anaerobes. Now I'm not saying that we have to treat every diabetic foot infection with metronidazole or anaerobic coverage, but I do think our understanding of these infections is gonna be changing with this uh, changing technology. I wanna go and do um, look from the perspective of the pathogen now. So we've talked about the host and all of the steps that make that host susceptible. So this is a study uh, looking at a diabetic mouse model and group B strep wound infections. And so they showed, here's our black 57 normal mice, that their diabetic model has hyperglycemia. And when you have that hyperglycemia, they have increasing wound area in their model and they isolate more GBS cells per wound or per, per standard compared to the normal, right? And you may say, well, there's probably more glucose and other nutrients um, in that wound. So maybe that's why GBS is growing to higher extent. And that could be true. When we look at host transcriptomics, these wounds are certainly hyper-inflammatory. So they can generate inflammation they just don't generate very effective inflammation. When we look at the bacterial transcripts, so now looking at what's happening to the bacteria in these wounds, basically we see an upregulation of virulence factors. So adhesins, the things that allow bacteria to grab onto our mucosal surfaces, our soft tissues, our hemolysin, which is a bacterial virulence factor specific for GBS that lyses red blood cells and white blood cells to release the nutrients in there so the bacteria can use them, and quorum sensing uh, virulence factors. So here, think biofilm. We think biofilm a lot in our world as far as like metals and stuff like that, but bacteria form biofilms on our mucosal surfaces. Strep pneumo film, forms biofilms in the nasopharynx. There's a lot of biofilms that are formed in the vaginal canal and in the GI tract. Not only that, but when they started isolating the bacteria back from these wounds, what you can see is there's a couple different colored colonies here. These are all group B strep. Normally when we grow group B strep in the lab, it's this kind of creamy white color, but some of these are deep red. What's going on there? This is that hemolysin pigment. So when we put these on blood auger, you can actually see the bacteria breaking down that blood auger and it becomes clear. And what they found is that in those mice that were hyperglycemic, over the course of the week, they were getting more and more of these pigment colonies. When you sequence those colonies, what's happening is that GBS is actually mutating its major two component system. This is how GBS controls its virulence and making it so that it's hypervirulent basically, right? So not only is this hyperglycemia changing the host, but it's also changing the pathogen and how the pathogen behaves. What about UTIs? So how do these happen? So normally we think that this is an ascending infection. Bacteria get into the urethra, go up the bladder, and they start causing infection. And then we have the normal mechanisms that help prevent that or the sheer flow of urination, washing those bacteria out, our mucosal immune systems, and the properties of urine. Most uropathogens don't grow great in urine. Some of them do better than others, but there's properties in urine that prevent that. So when we think about our SGL2 inhibitors, they're adding glucose into that urine. When we think about the neuropathic changes that change how urine flows and how the bladder empties. And we think about the immune dysfunction. These are all things that kind of culminate in uh, G uh, bacteria, including GBS causing these infections. What about the microbiome? So we know that the vaginal micro, uh, urinary microbiome is a risk factor for urinary tract infections. The best example of this is postmenopausal women. Those women have vaginal dryness, they lose the lactobacillus in the vaginal canal, and it's replaced by bacteria that can cause UTIs. And if we replace vaginal estrogens, the lactobacillus tends to come back and it has a protective effect against UTIs. So if we look at the microbiology of UTIs in patients with diabetes, it's urinary E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter. These are our Enterobacteraceae. 
Again, group B strep is making the list where it's not normally a cause of UTIs, enterococcus and staph are a minority. So this group looked at microbiome of patients, um, either diabetic patients or controls. The first thing I want you to notice is that there's a little bit of a loss in diversity in those patients with diabetes. The second thing is this bright orange group here that you don't really see down here. This is the Enterobacteraceae, that E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter. And when they quantified that, they actually saw a little bit of an increase in lactobacillus, which we typically think of as the good um, bacteria that helps prevent infections, but you really see this blooming of that Enterobacteraceae. What about GBS and U UTI? So this study basically looked at human urine and they basically added glucose to it to see how GBS behaved differently, trying to understand these infections. And so you can see in plain urine, here are these open triangles, GBS really didn't grow. They started with 10 to the seventh, they ended with 10 to the seventh, eight hours later. If you add glucose, to some extent, you can get GBS to grow a little bit better. It gets about a log fold increase. This top circle is tryptic soy broth. This is a bacterial broth we use in the lab. It gives the bacteria everything they need to grow. So it's not surprising that it grows more. So you can see adding glucose helps the bacteria out, whereas normal urine, GPS really can't grow in it. Now, what was interesting is even though you added a ton of glucose, you only so, so, saw so much growth here, but the bacteria were behaving differently they were much more likely to adhere to bladder cells. That's the first step in pathogenesis. They were much more likely to make this hemolysin that we saw a couple slides ago. So here's our plain urine, here's with the 300 uh, glucose, and you can see it's almost the same as our triptych soy broth. And they were also more resistant to antimicrobial peptides. So this is the second and third uh, line of defense, defenses in this system that just being in a high glucose environment is changing how the pathogen behaves. Now, I wouldn't be an ID doc talking about UTIs if I didn't mention asymptomatic bacteria. So what is this? This is, I find bacteria in my urine culture, but the patient has no symptoms at all. Several studies have shown elderly, all populations, that if we treat these people, they don't do any better, but we do generate antibiotic resistance for the next time they do develop symptoms, right? And so do patients with diabetes have asymptomatic bacteria? Well, of course they do. Their incidence rate was almost 25% of all comers with type two diabetes. There's of course certain risk factors, the duration of diabetes, your hemoglobin A1C. Now, don't go looking for this because you will find it. If you go culture a patient with diabetes, you're going to get a positive culture. You're going to be wanting to treat them and you're not going to do the patient any good. You're only going to make things harder down the road. So the 2019 Infectious Disease Society of America asymptomatic bacteria guidelines show, or this is one of the recommendations. In patients with diabetes, we recommend against screening or treating asymptomatic bacteria. So it's there, but it, if they're not having any symptoms, don't treat it. All right, section two recap. Patients with diabetes have an abnormal immune function, particularly in the innate immunity. While it's not as severe as those true primary immunodeficiencies, it certainly increases your risk, right? And the pathophysiology of obesity-related immune dysfunction differs a little bit from hyperglycemic-related immune dysfunction, but the consequences end up being pretty similar. And that we're starting to appreciate that the pathogens are not just active or passive players in this, they actually change in response to those nutrient concentrations in the microenvironment. And especially for GBS, it seems to be one of the mechanisms by which this relatively rare cause of normal infections in adults is becoming more prominent. All right, in the last couple of minutes, what I wanna do is do an introduction to my lab and some of the works that we're doing here. So my lab really sits and are the studies we do are at this intersection between bacterial pathogenesis with group B streptococcus as our model organism, particularly with those interactions with the innate immune system in the female reproductive tract. Typically we're looking at things like vaginal colonization or infections during pregnancy. And you may say, well, that's a weird thing for an adult infectious disease doc to study. And I'm gonna talk about that, why we are interested on the, in that in the next couple of slides. We become more interested in host metabolic disease and how that's changing this interaction between bacteria and host. So we're looking at it in the context of diabetes, but also zinc deficiencies. Two different um, metabolic states that we know increase your risk for pregnancy outcomes, increase your risk uh, 
for infections. And so some of the studies we're doing in our lab is looking at how bacteria use carbohydrates and how that may change their virulence, how they form biofilms and how that leads to colonization, how this then projects out to cause chorioamnitis or infection um, during pregnancy and how these different host conditions change our immune responses. So why am I interested in pregnancy outcomes and why should you care as an internist? One is because the US stands alone at how poorly we do pregnancy care in the developed world. We are number one. If you look at all causes, Sub-Saharan Africa, the United States, we're all in the top five as far as preterm births. And this is a report from 2022, the March of Dimes. And you can see that the US overall has a D plus grade, over 10% preterm birth rates. But that's much higher in the US Southeast, as high as 15% in Mississippi. All right, you say, well, these are kids. Why again should I care? When kids are born prematurely, there's not a system in their body that's not affected. There are risks for uh, neurologic deficits like hypoxic brain injury, chronic uh, respiratory issues like bronchopulmonary dysplasia, kidney issues, GI issues, and cardiovascular issues. And unfortunately, while the kids have to stay in the NICU sometimes for several months, the problems don't end there. The problems just evolve when they get to adulthood, right? So these early impacts on their health get carried forward to long-term health consequences like learning disabilities or mood disorders, chronic lung disease or asthma, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, hypertension and cardiovascular disease. If we cared about helping our population, we would focus on their early life events and the developmental origins of these diseases, because we, by the time they come to us as internists, we're managing the best we can, right? We're not preventing most of these at this point. So how do we study these infections, vaginal colonization and chorioaminitis? So we use human tissue models. So we get placentas from mom who undergo routine C-section and we take these fetal membranes and we can actually take them back to the lab and we can infect them to look at those host pathogen interactions and responses. We use mouse models of colonization and pregnancy infection. And then we have, I'm gonna show a little bit of our work from our vaginal colonization model. So one of the things that we're interested in is why GBS vaginal colonization is more common in patients with diabetes, right? Because we know that vaginal colonization is the major risk factor for these ascending pregnancy infections that result in preterm birth, neonatal sepsis, neonatal meningitis. And so we've been looking at the host pathogen interactions that allow GBS to colonize these patients. Because again, when GBS comes to the mucosal surface within the vagina, you have all these signaling, you have you know, immune cells coming in, all of these battles going on to make that space for GBS. And we know that GBS only colonizes about 30% of women in late pregnancy. So it's not everywhere, but certainly when people have diabetes, it's becoming more common. And so one of the things we've talked about biofilms, we can study biofilms in the lab. We have here two different strains of group B strep in regular, uh, regular bacterial growth media or media that we've added extra glucose to. When we grow it overnight, when you take off those cells, you can see what's stuck to the bottom. So this is the beginning of a biofilm, right? Really easy, simple to do. We can stain that with crystal violet and that crystal violet gets stuck in the cell wall of the bacteria, gets stuck in the biofilm. And then we can basically resolubilize that and we can measure it with a spectrophotometer. So when we look at our bacteria, several different strains of group B strep representing different invasive or colonizing strains. We can look at capsular type. We can look at all sorts of permutations. But here it's just a simple experiment. If we grow this bacteria in regular broth versus broth we supplement with extra glucose, you can see that the biofilm formation goes up for most of these cells, right? Well, is that just because we're giving them more nutrients and there's more bacteria there? So we can look at that. So these are growth curves. So you have your lag phase, your logarithmic phase where the bacteria are dividing rapidly. Uh, and then your lag, uh, your um, stationary phase is they basically used up most of the nutrients. And you can see that these lines basically overlap. So even though we're adding more glucose, it's not changing the kinetics of how GBS grows, but it's shifting its growth phase from just planktonic growth where it's kind of floating around in culture towards biofilms. <laughs> 
So when we wanted to start looking at vaginal colonization, we started with really simple models. You grow cells in a test tube or in a, a dish, you put bacteria on it. And that's not a very effective way to really look at host pathogen interactions. And that's because after a couple of hours, most of those cells are dead. Your bacteria quickly win because they divide much faster than those cells. So we've moved to this model where we basically have this membrane here that has these small pores. We can add our vaginal epithelial cells on top here and grow them into these kind of multicellular layers. So all the nutrition, all the nutrients, uh, the glucose, everything is coming from the bottom and basically there's just air on top. So it's a more biologically relevant model that we're using. And when we do this, we can actually stain, we can see GBS on the surface using a GBS lysate antibody. And this really allows us to study those interactions over a longer period of time than we could in traditional culture. And so what do we do when we wanna study diabetes? Um, so we basically add these cells onto this membrane. And then after about five days, we're gonna grow some of the cells in increasing concentrations of glucose, and then we'll infect with GBS. And we'll look at those interactions either by scanning electron microscopy or um, look at the cytokine responses. So these are the, some scanning electron micrographs from the top of these cells. So on the top, we have uninfected, and we've grown these cells in increasing concentrations of glucose. And I think most of us can appreciate, at least from a serum perspective, these numbers are definitely physiologic. They're numbers that we see in our patients with various levels of glycemic control. And the uninfected surface of these cells looks relatively normal. We have this nice cobblestone appearance of the epithelial cells. Now, when we add the bacteria to them, you see very few bacteria under our kind of standard glucose conditions or normal media. But we see as we increase our glucose content, you have this shag carpet forming on the surface of this cell. This is biofilm forming uh, in these increasing concentrations of glucose. And the more glucose you have, the more biofilm that's being formed on the surface. Again, all the nutrition is coming from the bottom. The bacteria don't have any direct interaction with the cell culture media. What about the cytokine responses? We talked about those pro-inflammatory mediators earlier on in the talk, things like IL-8, IL-6, GMCSF. When we have cells that are uninfected, they make very little cytokines. But when we infect them with GBS, you get this nice kind of bump in your cytokine secretion. That's what we'd expect. You come in contact with a pathogen, you start calling for help. But when we start culturing these cells in increasing concentrations of glucose, what we saw is that there was a dose dependent decrease in these pro-inflammatory mediators. The more glucose is there, the less signaling they are for help. And you may say, well, maybe the cells are just dying under these conditions. We know there's a lot of bacteria there. Well, they're actually then secreting more of an anti-inflammatory signal, right? So the balance of our inflammation is shifting from what we'd expect, pro-inflammation to call the for help to really anti-inflammation. And this balance between this IL-1 receptor antagonist that basically blocks the function of IL-1 in response to this decrease in concentrations would suggest that maybe we're not gonna be as effective at calling those neutrophils and phagocytes to come and help with this infection. So our recap here, in our normal conditions, GBS hits these vaginal epithelial cells, they call for help with things like IL-6, IL-8, GMCSF. But when we have glucose present, they're tending to make more biofilms on the surface. And we have a shift in that inflammation from that pro-inflammatory response to a more anti-inflammatory response. And all of these together, increased biofilm formation, decreased inflammation, we hypothesize leads to more sustained vaginal colonization. So we've talked a lot of, about a lot of different things. The things that I want you to take home from this talk, with the increasing prevalence of diabetes and obesity, rates of infections are gonna go up and we're gonna be seeing more infections that were previously rare. My biggest worry is that this is gonna put increasing pressure on our already problem of antibiotic resistance, right? If you think about our outpatients that are now getting 25 to 50% more prescriptions over a period of time, increased antibiotic use, subsequent times they get those infections, it's gonna be harder to treat. We've talked about the immune deficits in diabetes. There are multiple subtle deficits in immune function, microbiome changes, physiologic changes like neuropathy that in the setting of hyperglycemia or obesity culminate to this increased risk. 
right? But when you think about all of the places where the immune system is just not quite as good, it's not like we're gonna be able to come up with a single strategy to kind of reverse this deficit. Same thing when we look at our pathogens, these are not passive things, right? These are microorganisms that sense and respond to the changes in the host niche. When that happens, you get this increased virulence, at least with group B strep, but probably with other bacteria as well. And so I think there is gonna be more work in, here, in this area, trying to shift that virulence back. Is there something we can do with that bacterial regulation to get that so it's not as virulent? And with that, uh, I'd like to thank my lab. So uh, a lot of the work that I showed for my lab was done by uh, Joel Omage when I was at Vanderbilt. I now have a postdoc, Nago Elbaz and Chris Farrell, a graduate student who are working on this project. We have collaborators both to the north and south of us at IU, Michigan State and Vanderbilt. And uh, this work is currently being funded by a KO8 so that we can do this work and try to better understand how metabolic disease influence bacterial infections. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. So that's really spectacular. And it really emphasizes the importance of nutrition, which is underlying all of this. And I'm hoping that uh, down the road, we can actually start to look at the changes when you start to do uh, nutrition interventions, uh, which parts of the immune system or the response uh, of the pathogens. Uh, changes. Uh, so I'm looking forward to all that you're going to do. I'm going to turn over to Dr. Arnold if you want, or I can. Well, I'll, I'll just say a quick comment okay. based on that. So I actually Please. had looked looked for studies specifically for the chair's prerogative that I knew was coming. Um, and, you know, a lot of these studies are now that we can actually do them based on these kind of nationwide population data studies to look at rates of infection and diabetes, because you really need a large cohort to be able to do them. There are not you know, most of these studies are done because they have diagnostic categories that we can identify. And nutrition is something that I think is harder to identify as far as these large groups that we're gonna need. You know, there is some data that suggests that during COVID, if you had higher sugary diets or increased diets of fruits that, that they kind of associate with diabetes or not diabetes, but obesity, that your risk for infection was up. But I think we have to be really thoughtful on how we structure these diabetic or these nutritional interventions to study them, because I think it is not as easy as pulling diagnostic codes. Thank you for that. Um, I have more of a comment than a question. And that is just to say that this is not as simple as we want to make it. Like you put person, people in immunosuppressed or non-immunosuppressed category, there's kind of a gradient there, especially with diabetes. And infections and in diabetics is multifactorial. It doesn't just have to do with mixing in uh, HIV or obesity or your diet, that uh, it's very complex. And so the solutions are also equally complex. Absolutely agree. And again, this is not gonna be something that I think that we are gonna be able to target one specific pathway, one specific system. It's, you know, the easy thing would be to reverse the diabetes and obesity and prevent it from happening, but that's, doesn't look like the trend that we're going on. So I don't know that we're gonna be able to pharmacologically get our way out of this situation. I think it's gonna be much more complex than that. Who else has a question? And Jason, I assume you're monitoring the computer chat. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Doster. Great talk. I think I enjoyed everything from the ID perspective, the statistics perspective, and also medicine in general. I like the approach of us trying to treat and also prevent. And my question is on that regards, because I know that nowadays we have a lot of SGLT2 inhibitor use, as you mentioned, not only for the diabetes, but also for heart failure prevention. And it's becoming like kind of the gold standard, right? So now we're seeing more uh, UTIs in our population. And I know that sometimes with diabetic patients, the symptoms are not clearly, you know, relevant for UTI symptoms because of their like kind of nervous system impairment. So my question to you is how is the ID community, what are we, like what, are, what should be our approach in this case? Are we prone to treat the same amount of days? I know that there might not be a lot of data on it, but I just want to know as a fellow, how should I approach this? So again, let's separate inpatient and outpatient, right? 
because we know that they're there in both. Asymptomatic bacteria is very common. And I wouldn't necessarily say stay away from the SGL2 inhibitors. If you have some patient that has recurrent UTIs, I think that then becomes a part of the discussion of risk and benefits of using that medication versus other medications, right? I still think in most diabetic patients, they have some degree of symptoms that you can point to and say, okay, there's a reason to send this urine. I would not send the urine just to send it because we know that there are increased risk of asymptomatic bacteria and treatment of those patients is not super helpful. So I think you have to be very deliberate in how we use antibiotics in these patients because they, we know they're gonna get infections down the road. And if we give them too many antibiotics along the way, down the road when they really need them, we may not have them available. So online, uh, if we go back just a little bit. Uh is there Dr. Emmons uh, has actually a, a cloaked nutrition question, which is about the microbiome. You've talked a lot about local microbiome and, uh, and infection, but is there evidence in your opinion that the GI microbiome is a master regulator of immunity overall? And is the GI microbiome more slash the same determinant for systemic infections, local and disseminated, certainly diabetes and obesity uh, effects and is affected by the GI microbiome. Yeah, so this is a chicken and egg question, right? So what came first? Did you have a microbiome that predisposed you to diabetes or obesity, yeah. or did you have a lifestyle that changed your microbiome or physiology that changed your microbiome? And I don't think we know yet. I certainly think we understand that there are certain microbes in the GI microbiome that puts you at risk for obesity and probably puts you at risk to some degree for types of diabetes, probably mostly type two how we use that microbiome data to shift the microbiome to improve our health, I think is an ongoing question. You know, if we think the C. diff, we're now using oral formulations of microbiomes to try to restore the normal gut. And they had to do a lot of studies before they rolled that out so that we weren't giving potential changes in the microbiome that would affect the health down, downstream. So I think we're gonna get there over the next five years. I don't think we're quite there yet. Our division chief in endocrinology, uh, Sri Mashagundam, excellent talk. More reason not to ignore diabetes and prediabetes. What is the impact of glucose after an infection has occurred versus uh, poor control prior? So in the hospital, the thing I worry about most, and I'm gonna use diabetic foot infections as the example. So somebody comes in, they got a diabetic foot infection, they have to have an amputation. As far as cleanup of these infections, with antibiotics, we can treat the infections. I'm not super worried about that, but I am worried about their healing and risk for recurrence, right? So if somebody has an amputation and their hemoglobin A1C is not well controlled, it's elevated, they have hyperglycemia, those are the patients that I'm talking to about really working on that because I'm worried that their wound isn't gonna heal, it's gonna open up and we're gonna get something else in there and it's gonna become a vicious cycle. Um, so I think, you know, that's my biggest concern is the healing after this response. Um, whereas antibiotics, we're still able to treat these infections. But again, the more often we have to do it, it's going to get harder over time because we're going to get uh, more antibiotic resistance. Dr. Gahar is asking, have you looked at the success of glycemic control in our, our own uh, university hospital ICU and rates of group B strep infections here? impression uh, is that the results will be suboptimal. Any insights? So I don't have much uh, understanding of where we are doing with our ICU as far as glycemic control. I don't think there's a whole lot of data if my hemoglobin A1C is 11, but I come into the ICU and I have really tight glucose control. How quickly do we overcome some of those immune deficits? I think that's still an ongoing question and it's a little bit hard to tease out because most of the studies looking at the innate immunity is in a test tube from neutrophils or macrophages with diabetes. But a lot of our cell culture data is really, these cell culture medias have really high concentrations of glucose in it. It's one of the barriers, I think, to really understanding this. So whether there may be some epigenetic changes that carry forward longer, neutrophils are relatively short-lived cells. So you'd like to think if you can bring them into being in a more euglycemic environment, they'd function better. But I don't think we don't, that we truly understand kind of the nuances of how long you need to be normal before you kind of restore function. 
So I don't know that that completely answers the question. My impression is most people come into the ICU, they have those infections already. So the rapid change of glycemic control in the setting of healthcare, how beneficial that is, I don't think we know that yet. Good question. So Dr. Bay is asking, in addition to diet, should we focus more on attaining meaningful physical exercise levels? So we know that diet plus exercise, they all have beneficial impacts on the microbiome. In addition to lowering your, you know, your glucose levels, I'm for all of it. I think, you know, what we don't do enough, especially as ID docs is I'm finding myself talking more about this stuff, talking more about diabetes when they're in there in the hospital. And it's one of the conversations I often have before they go home again, We've had three patients, you know, just this week with these type of infections and anything they can do to improve their glycemic control, I think can go a long way. So whether that's diet, exercise, it's all part of a bigger, healthy lifestyle picture that we are not doing all that well in the, in the U.S. right now. Just... Yeah. So the question was that we know that when you have a diet high in simple sugars, it changes some of the transport in the GI tract and potential leakiness and changes in the microbiome. Does that happen during pregnancy? It probably happens in the vaginal canal. There haven't been studies that clearly show that vaginal fluid from patients with diabetes compared to those that not have changes in glucose levels, but I suspect that they do similar to the gut because it's a similar epithelial structure and a similar, um, kind of function to some degree. When you get up into the placenta, there's not as much secretion there. It's more gas exchange between mother and baby. So I think that's probably less of a factor, but I do think it's a factor in the vaginal colonization that then culminates in that ascending infection up into the uterus. Okay, it looks like we have covered the whole world. Um, and I, <laughs> I uh, uh, appreciate it. I want uh, closing comments, uh, Dr. Arnold? Okay. Uh huh. Now, uh, and and we do the cardinal minute. 